everyone. Welcome to the Primi Chat. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm Fabiana Bakin, Executive Director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation, CPBF. We are a charitable organization and our mission is to empower families of premature babies through support and education. This Premi Chat series is one of the many initiatives we have to bring information for NICU families and healthcare professionals. Here every Friday, we talk with experts, researchers, and parents who share with us their experience and knowledge. Also on our website, canadianpremies.org, parents will find all kinds of resources and support. For example, this week, we launched our new infographic on kangaroo care. I'm gonna share here with you. Uh, to mark the International Kangaroo Care Day, which is this Sunday, May 15th. You can download it on our website. I will share the link on the comments. Let me take this out. And I also want to thank our sponsor, AstraZeneca and Medilla Canada for supporting our educational program. And this week on Privy Chat, CPBF, in collaboration with the Canadian Association of Neonatal Nurses, are recognizing the dedication, commitment, and compassion of new NATO nurses who continue to work tirelessly to keep our babies and families safe. The last two and a half years have been very challenging, and we know how the restrictions regarding parental presence in the NICU have affected not only parents, but also nurses. We want to recognize their advocacy to keep parents and babies together, their long shifts, they are extra shifts to ensure our most vulnerable babies are well taken care of. We see you. Nurses truly leave a mark in our lives as NICU parents. And today we want to acknowledge that. You can never thank them enough for caring for our babies, for holding our hands, for teaching us how to parent through the glass, how to hold our babies on ventilators and how to pump. You want to thank them for crying with us when things don't go well or when babies die. You want to thank them for celebrating every gram they gain and for wishing us well on discharge day. Many of us, after long NICU stays, wish we could take them home, but we are grateful for how they prepare us to continue parenting on our own. I want to give a special shout out to all the nurses who volunteer here at CPBF especially Doris Dixon, our chair board, Marianne Brack and Marcia Cambrio, our committee chairs. We couldn't do what we do without them. And today we have three amazing speakers for our premium chats. Uh, first up, we have Rebecca Thomas talking about her experience as a NICU nurse and how becoming a NICU parent changed her. Next, we have Laura Seckington, a premium parent sharing her journey with two NICU nurses and finally, Chantel Morin, a clinical nurse educator, preemie parent, and former preemie, will share her story and the role of the Canadian Association of Neonatal Nurses. So let's welcome our first guest here. Let me bring her to the stream. Rebecca Thomas, a clinical leader at the NICU at McMaster Children's Hospital in Hamilton, Ontario. She began work as a nurse at McMaster NICU in 2005 and delivered her son prematurely in 2014. She now functions as the lead for the NICU Family Advisory Team on Unit Capacity Management and Patient Flow, Human Milk Preparation Space, as it, as, and is in the team and co-chair the NICU Nutrition Committee. She serves as a director on the board of the Canadian Association of Neonatal Nurses and chair the Professional Development Committee. Her experience as a NICU parent informs each decision she makes and every initiative she participates in. She'll talk about her experience as a NICU nurse and how becoming a NICU parent elevated her professional perspective on the family experience in the NICU. Rebecca will share her reflections on the weeks that followed her son's premature delivery and how they shaped and continue to shape her nursing practice. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm so honored uh, to have you on this uh, Nursing Week, National Nursing Week, and sharing your incredible story that it really brought me to tears last year. And I'm so grateful that you are here today sharing a little bit more in depth your journey. Thank you so, so much for having me. You brought me to tears with your thank you and acknowledgement of, of everything that NICU nurses um, 
bring to the experience and the journey uh, families have in the NICU. Still got them in my eyes, so I think you've effectively got me back for the last time. <laughs> So I will let you uh, uh, present your slides now. And for all of you watching us live from home or from the hospital, please do send your comments, your questions, and we're going to address uh, after Rebecca's presentation. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, so I, I want to go back a little further than I did the last time and go back to when I was a kid. And when I was thinking about what I wanted to be when I grew up, I knew I wanted to be a helper. That was for sure. I wasn't sure how, but I wanted to help people. I was attracted to professions as I was growing up where I could equip myself with skills to assist other people, to promote healing and community. And I think I got very, very lucky in my fourth year of nursing when by random selection, I was awarded an NICU student placement. My preceptor was experienced and knowledgeable. She had been nursing for decades. She suffered many questions from me. The more I knew, the more questions I had. I was that nurse. I am that nurse. Getting to the bottom of the physiology, the anatomy, the pharmacology. I wasn't satisfied with a skim the surface type answer and probably drove a few people crazy. I wanted diagrams, mind maps, and was keen on seeing how things related to one another, affected one another, worked together or against one another. Interventions, treatment, physiology. And how did the care affect the individual? And how did the individual respond to the care? Fast forward a few years, and I had the opportunity to attend a workshop called The Working Mind a few years ago, just before COVID became a reality in Canada and everything started to shut down. It was a one-day workshop meant for leaders to help equip us to support individual and team well-being related to mental health, a pretty important topic. The group was made up of many disciplines and this only added to the richness and depth of the discussions that we were able to have. The group uh, had an orthopedic surgeon in it and he was the one who had been practicing for decades and told all of us about his method for mentorship. He described how he would come alongside a resident doctor who was struggling. Come alongside. There was a concept that really stuck with me and um, brought up a lot of imagery from the NICU. I liked it for several reasons. One, he was neither in front of or behind the person receiving support, but instead walking alongside. The approach was gentle, unstructured, and opened up the opportunity for relationship. Relationship offered the opportunity for feedback, encouragement, and appreciation for the fact that the journey wasn't easy. My early nursing mentors came alongside me. They didn't stand out in front or let me lose on my own without support. They walked beside me. They met me where I was and helped me move forward. And the day I became a NICU parent, I felt the same exact presence from my care team. I delivered our, delivered our son several weeks early and this for me marked a crossing to the other side of the curtain, a position I was not used to being in within the unit I loved to work. Turns out our son was in the same bed space, so the bed space just beside the baby I was a, a primary nurse for. What a trip. <laughs> Celebrating our son's eighth birthday this summer means that there's been a lot of space between our NICU experience and now, lots and lots of time to reflect. Reflective practice is a key part of every nurse's routine. It discourages ego, invites us to review our footsteps and adjust course moving forward. We're gonna show you just another one here of Oliver and the NICU there. On Nurses Week, I'd also like to celebrate with reflection on the nurses among many talented members of the multidisciplinary team in the NICU who cared for my family and saved our son's life. These are the nurses who came alongside me in our NICU journey. In the early hours of labor, I was on a flight from Vancouver to Toronto contracting every 10 minutes. A little later in that early labor, we were racing up the 407 towards McMaster. A little later still in that journey, I was at McMaster Children's Hospital um, working on delivering uh, in their labor and delivery unit. I was lucky enough to be cared for by both my midwife and the labor and delivery nurses in that unit 
who I'd had the opportunity to work with as a NICU admission nurse for the preceding two years. So we had good relationships. They are magical. They ex to experience their knowledge, their skill, and all the experience that they've had helping laboring mothers through those hours was unbelievable and such an honor. Their particular brand of steadfast, calm, and focused was exactly what I needed. Part of that NICU admission team that day was a nurse practitioner. I mentioned before that my early nursing mentors were key in teaching me what it meant to come alongside someone. I was lucky enough to have several nurse practitioners take me under their wing and in some of the most formative years of my nursing practice, help me to find perspective, direction, and create a strong foundation for my practice. The NP that helped our little guy after birth was someone I'd known since I was a student. In some of the most vulnerable moments of my life, he led the initial steps by the NIC team that turned his quiet news to weak cries, which was a huge improvement. Neonatal NPs are such a special group of people. The type of care they provide is different, different than anything else. It can be both lightning fast during a situation of resuscitation or intentionally slow, steady, focusing on a moment with the family and capturing every detail upon which they structure their formidable care plans. I still learn so much from them to this day. As many of you know, the NICU sees the tiniest veins in the world, and we see a lot of very tiny babies uh, in my unit. As a result, we have some extremely talented nurses in the art of vascular access. Our admission nurse, our admission team tapped one of our transport nurses on the shoulder when our baby needed an IV after birth. One poke, she said to me afterwards. I'm grateful for her skill and care. Members of our transport team have also been pivotal in developing my nursing practice and the nursing practice of many in our unit. Highly skilled and talented professionals who have the ability to descend on what is often a very messy and perilous situation for a newborn and meticulously, systematically create order and stability. It's truly a gift. The nurses caring for babies and their families for 12 long hours at the bedside come at the challenge of providing care in the NICU from their own angle. A long list of tasks to accomplish means structure and function to everything that they do with, with a family and a child to move that child forward with, in growth, development, and stability. On top of that, they also have this powerful ability to help develop the bond between a baby and their loved ones through touch and service. By service, I mean all the ways a child's grown-ups fulfill the child's needs bathing, feeding, snuggling, singing, positioning, changing, dressing. Our nurse gave us space during our first visit when I couldn't hold back my tears. I still remember her lowering the incubator so I could see and touch this kid I didn't even recognize as my own. She called me mom for the first time. I sure didn't feel like it. But then I didn't know what a mom felt like. Maybe being uncertain, powerless, and overwhelmed was just like what being a mother was all about. Eight years later and two kids in, I think I wasn't as far off as I thought I was after all. Throughout our NICU admission, our nurses sent me pictures, picked up on tiny changes in our baby's condition, and advocated for interventions. Eyes on a child for 12 hours really gives them an edge when it comes to noticing small changes. That time I got Pumper's neck, I made that up, but I'm pretty sure it's a thing. One of our sweet nurses surprised me with a magic bag at the bedside. I could barely move my neck at the time and this was such a welcome thing, I didn't know what to do. I was so thankful for her care and for her concern. The magic bag was a life saver. One of the nursing heroes of my journey in the NICU, maybe the type of nursing hero that doesn't get talked about as much, was my postpartum nurse. On that first quiet and lonely night, she sat on the bed, my hospital bed, beside me and put her arm around me as I cried. No baby inside me, no baby beside me. I felt so, so lonely. My nurse walked alongside me that night and supported me through those first really difficult hours. Her strength helped me put one foot in front of the other. She showed me how to hand express and brought me a pump. 
She walked alongside me and helped me grieve the separation. As a mother, her care was, in, was invaluable. As a nurse, I'm proud of how she cared for me and for the rest of her patients with such tremendous compassion. Another difference maker for me was a lactation consultant nurse. I'd always taken the time to support mothers with pumping as a bedside nurse, walking with them to the pumping room, showing them how to use the equipment, helping them adjust the, the settings, and encouraging a relationship with the lactation consultants in our unit. But boy, oh boy, pumping was difficult work. I had no idea how exhausting that it was. I had a relatively short relationship with the NICU, measured in weeks and not in months and years like some families. So the entire admission, my body was in pretty rough shape and pumping, pumping was, was difficult, but we did it. About seven days in, I finally was able to bring more than a couple of drops uh, to the NICU and I took a picture of the contents of the fridge because I was so thrilled with what I had accomplished. The things I never figured I would be excited about, but here it is. This is the picture that I took. Our LC had sat with me, put her hand on my shoulder and said, it's gonna be okay. She showed me what to do, adjusted everything, adjusted everything again and worked out a schedule for me to follow and taught me the word delayed lactoneogenesis. What a bummer. I didn't want to learn that frustrating word. As a NICU nurse, I'm used to having control over a certain number of variables when I'm in the unit, and I just felt completely powerless. My body was doing its own thing. Oliver was doing his own thing, and I was kind of trying to find my way in the middle. These are just a few of, of the professional nurses that made a huge difference in our NICU journey, and they were active members in our care. Some of the quieter members of our care were the leaders and educators behind the scene, moving the unit forward steadily so that the quality of care grew ever greater. Now that this is my role in the NICU, I have a great appreciation for what we can achieve as a result of their efforts. My professional and personal journeys in the NICU are intertwined. I can barely tell them apart anymore. I'm so lucky to believe so strongly in the work that I do. And I truly think that now that I've had this experience, I really get the impact of our care on, on families, the words that we choose, the compassion that we show, the emotion we show, you know, to your point in the introduction when you were thinking, and I see nurses, Fabiana, the, the, the crying with each other when things don't go so well and the celebration when things are going well. Um, it's really an honor. Uh, and so as professionals, uh, as a nurse, I want to say that this is our opportunity to come alongside families and parents in their journey. And this is exactly what happened to me. And I'm so grateful for that. And it will ever be. So that's what I have for my presentation, Fabiana. Wow, Rebecca, thank you. I always cry when you speak because it's big from your heart and so raw and beautiful. I'm very grateful for you um, being here with us today, celebrating Nurses Week. We know it's been a very uh, challenging time to say the least for the last two and a half years. And we truly appreciate everything that the nurses are doing for the families and going through because I follow a lot of nurses on social media and I see the endless hours, the, the short of staff, and it, it, I know it's been very challenging, so we, we really appreciate. So I think my first question to you is, after um, the NICU experience, how was for you going back to work, like your first week in the NICU, in the same NICU, NICU where your child was, how was that experience and how it changed you at that moment? That's a really good question because it was a definite phase, the going back. And it, I think it's something that not many parents get, get to experience or need to experience unless then they have a second or a third baby in the NICU. Um, that first day, I avoided the pod where, I, where we spent our intensive care portion of the stay. And probably two or three weeks in, uh, though I had been in the unit in all the other places, I 
I went back to B2, which is where we were. And, um, and to say that I didn't have flashbacks or relive those moments, they just came right back to the surface. Like they were not a year or, or two in the past. They just came right back to the surface and I acknowledged them and, you know, looked around me at the families who were in the same position that I was a year before. And I just, I was so grateful. Um, I think gratitude was the other major emotion and, and um, experience that I had going back because I realized I knew what I had. I knew we were lucky and I knew that, you know, a health and a healthy and happy baby coming home was, you know, was such a wonderful thing. And so I just, I felt really lucky and really grateful in those moments um, after I came back into those spaces. Because we always talk to parents, right? How hard it is sometimes to go into the, the hospital, sometimes just to use the hand sanitizer at the hospital that triggers all those memories. Like, I cannot even imagine like how it is to for you, first of all, to be in, a, in different shoes in the ICU as a parent with all your skills and your knowledge uh, and, and to go back to work afterwards. But my next question is, when you were in the NICU as a parent, how did you separate your nurse hat from your mom's hat? Because I feel, okay, I might adjust the ventilator right now instead of calling the nurse because you know how to do it, right? You don't have to call a nurse versus I need to call a nurse for everything. So what was the boundary for you or not jumping and do things that because you're not a nurse, you were a mom at that moment? Yeah, and, and it was very difficult to see to, to separate the two. Um, as I said, I'm lucky to have a job I am so invested in and believe in with my whole heart. And so it, there was no off switch to find. And so, and, and a lot of people weren't expecting me to deliver a baby yet. So from the back, it looked like they could ask me for an IV or, or ask them for assistance with their assignment or whatever, whatever it was. I actually delivered my son the day I was supposed to be in charge. So there was, there was maybe not awareness that I had delivered my sons so when I turned around and half my belly was missing. It was obvious then, but the, um, it, uh, it was very difficult. And so there's those moments of, oh, I should step in. But then at the same time, I, I, I knew that my team wanted and I wanted for my team to look after us. And certainly they relied on me if, you know, I noticed things or they would ask me questions or speak to me with the lingo and the language because I understood it. Um, so those were the, those were the things that maybe were a little bit different for me, but um, it was a lot of, a lot of talking actually, because people weren't expecting to see me there in, in a bedside with a, with a baby. And uh, when they did, then there was, oh, this is what happened. And here I am. And, and, you know, they expressed care and concern and, um, which was wonderful. Um, but yeah, a lot of uh, explaining. <laughs> I, I bet. Uh, so you said in the beginning of your, of your talk that you've spent a lot of time reflecting. Uh, you had eight years to reflect on your journey, but being a nurse is a constant reflection of practices. When you reflect back now uh, and you look at the days when you were a nurse prior to having a preterm baby and now, what changed for you? I think it, it was those silent moments that parents would have. The, it was the silence that now I interpret differently. I think most of all, that silence during the first visit, that's shock. That silence, that first night, you know, when, when, when I see them at the bedside, just exhausted to, to understand the loneliness. Mm -hmm. and the uncertainty and the powerlessness um, and even the silence for mums or dads at the bedside when there was something to do but but there wasn't that confidence in being able to to do it yet you know the first diaper change the first hold you know even talking to a parent about do you want to put your hand in and do you want to lay your hand on on your son's arm or and so 
And I think the other thing that changed for me too is a little bit of language, how I would communicate because, you know, when you see hundreds and hundreds of babies and, you know, even there's close to a hundred in the unit right now, you don't always remember first names, but to make the, the effort to your son or your daughter, or like put, put things into terms that are more relatable to a parent and less about being a healthcare provider. Does that, does that make sense to not, not, um, not say baby or, I mean, to, baby's fine, but to make, if I have the opportunity to say your daughter, your son, to sort of foster that connection and that bond, um, those are the, the, the subtle things that changed for me as a result of reflecting on my experience. That is beautiful. I will wrap up your session with this beautiful comment that came here from Carissa Joy. So thank you for joining us here today. She said, as a parent who was looking for support during a long NICU stay, Rebecca was an amazing clinical leader who could empathize with parents. You can definitely see their impact. Her and I see stay head on her as a person and understanding the path of new parents there. Thank you back for all your help during our stay. So I think that says volumes of who you became as a nurse. And it's like, it, it, I, I feel very emotional, even though I never had you in the care of my son. But that is a, mm -hmm. is a beautiful story. And Rebecca, I'm so grateful that you uh, took some time away from your family and from work to be here with us today celebrating uh, National Nursing Week. So thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. And we are going to have our uh, next session now with, um, give me one second to get organized here, with Laura Secton. Let me welcome her into our streaming. She is a mother of three, with three and a half year old twin girls, Penny and Brooke, and currently on maternity leave for her six month old daughter, Rachel. Her twins were born at 29 weeks gestation at Mount Sinai Hospital, where they spent 58 days in the NICU. She's a special education teacher in Toronto and has become passionate about prematurity awareness and helped to run a premium clothing bank for the Toronto Parents of Multiple Birth Association in an effort to support families in the NICU. Her talk is all about sharing her journey with, her, with their primary nurses, for integral part of their hospital stay. Laura, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, it's been an emotional uh, session so far, and I know you have a beautiful story to share with our audience as well. Hi, Fabiana. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really exciting to uh, talk about this today. I really have not... Um, shared the the depth of our story with uh, too many people outside of our family who was there with us. Um, we were very lucky that this all happened uh, prior to COVID. So a lot of our NICU stay um, involved a lot of people, not only the nurses, but our family uh, to support us as well. Uh, they were kind of <laughs> in a revolving door, as you can imagine, and as you know. So I'm really happy uh, to be able to do this today to honor those amazing nurses that helped us not only in the NICU, but um, every step of the way. And I was listening to Rebecca speak and and I think um, she sort of encompasses all of the I, I can tell just by listening to her all of what we loved about the nurses uh, that we had around us. And uh, so it was really great to hear her speak as well. So I will start off by just telling you a little bit about our family and the journey that led us to um, Mount Sinai, which is where we spent a lot of our time in 2018 and 2019. So a little bit about us. Uh, we live in Toronto. We are a family of five now. Uh, my husband and I are both teachers. I teach uh, special education with a focus on um, students with autism, autism spectrum disorder. Um, and my husband is a high school phys ed teacher. Uh, so we are very used to working alongside people. And I know that I work in a class of sometimes five kids and seven adults at one time. So I'm, I'm very used to being with uh, other adults and learning with and, and from them. So I think that was why um, a lot of our NICU story was was successful and, and how we sort of got through it um, in that sense. So that's our family as we were last summer. And then I, 
we added another one and, and we haven't had time to take a, an updated family photo yet. We will be doing that soon. So I had a very uh, quote unquote normal twin pregnancy, if you can even call that normal. Um, I, I We have lots of twins running in our family. So finding out that I was having twins, um, I really didn't blink an eye. Uh, so it, everything was going really great. And then when I was 24 weeks, uh, my water spontaneously broke. And again, my husband was actually away for the weekend and I casually drove myself to North York General Hospital. And I said, you know, my water's broke. And they looked at my, my stomach and they said, great, we'll get you admitted. And I said, no, no, you know, this isn't a singleton pregnancy. This is twins and I'm only 24 weeks. And at that point, um, the gravity of the situation kind of hit. And, you know, being a young uh, person uh, with not not even much experience with niece and nephews yet, I, I really thought that um, that this wasn't really as serious as it was. So I actually at North York met the first nurse that I had come in contact with. And remembering that I was a fairly healthy young person, I really hadn't even spent a night in a hospital. I, I didn't know any nurses myself, so I, I didn't really know what to expect. I met a nice nurse named Angela at North York, and she helped me <laughs> as I frantically tried to get in contact with family members. It was about seven in the morning. Uh, my husband had a time difference where he was, was not even in the country. Uh, so she helped me a lot and, and was really, I have to say my partner uh, for the next couple hours. She even put her, her name and number in my phone and said, you know, when your babies are born, I want you to send me a picture of them. And in my naivete still at the time, I thought, well, they're not going to be born for another two or three months. Um, but clearly that was not going to be the case. And she probably knew that as well. So I came to Mount Sinai and I sort of checked into my room and I was there for five weeks on bed rest in the antenatal unit. And I like to joke that um, this was sort of my Toronto bachelorette apartment. Um, I'd never lived on my own before. And this was five weeks where I, I lived in my own room. Um, so I uh, met many nurses in the antenatal unit. One of the ones that stuck out the most to me, her name was Catherine. And uh, she made me laugh every single day. Uh, they would come in, they would do their rounds and, um, really made me feel like I was doing a good job um, in whatever I was doing. And I was a little bit psychosomatic at the time. So I would say, oh, I've got this ear, I've got this ear thing. And they would send me down to ENT to get it checked out, or I've got a cramp here or a cramp there. Uh, very normal pregnancy type things that they, they really honored my feelings at the time. And they honored uh, my request to have things checked out and things like that very, very patient. Um, I really can't say enough of, enough about that antenatal unit. I miss a lot of them a lot. Uh, me and my husband still talk about how, uh, how great they were for us there. And then uh, my twins were born. So after five weeks in the antenatal unit, my twins were born and their original due date was supposed to be March 3rd, 2019. And they were actually born on my birthday on December 18th. So we share a birthday, which is really fun. And it was totally spontaneous. Uh, so 29 weeks and two days, they joined us. And Penny and Brooke were both the exact same weight, two pounds, 14 ounces. And that picture is of me when I was first wheeled into the NICU, um, I guess the day that they were born. And one of the things I remember is meeting a nurse and she said, wow, your babies are so big. And I thought, really? They, you know, they don't look, uh, they don't look very big to me. They don't even look healthy to me. But the fact that she said, you know, your babies look really big, you know, you must come from a family of big babies. Like, you know, saying things that were so something so normal that you'd say to a new mom. Um, I really appreciated that because it made me feel like, okay, there's some, there's some normalcy to this situation. And clearly these nurses have, have seen babies like this before. And maybe our, our babies are a little bit bigger, which, which uh, was very helpful to hear at that time. So then we spent our holidays in the NICU. So we, uh, they were born a week before Christmas. And during this time, this was the hardest time for me. Um, no one really writes you a handbook on 
how many hours to be there, um, you know, when you should come in the morning, when you should leave. And people say, you know, try to get there for rounds in the morning. It's really hard if you live farther away. We were about 40 minutes from Mount Sinai at the time. Um, so adjusting to this uh, new environment was really hard for me. I was very sad to leave them. And especially when the holidays came around, oh my goodness. Um, it seemed like uh, Christmas came and, you know, our families were saying, OK, let's do our typical four Christmases that we always do. Um, but that was very hard for me. It was hard for me to leave them. It was hard for me to talk about them um, when we were at Christmas dinner. Um, I just didn't want to be anywhere else, obviously. So I was actually really um, anxious for the holidays to pass. I wanted them to be done with and I wanted it to be the new year. Um, so that was our uh, baby's first Christmas um, under the blue lights there. I think this was before we'd even uh, been able to hold them. And there they are in the middle when they first got their uh, masks changed uh, or the CPAP changed where we were able to see them. And again, something so normal that uh, the, our primary nurse at the time, who I'll, I'll get into in a minute, um, she said, oh, they're so cute. And I looked at them and I thought, oh, they look so um, small and weak. And, you know, their ears were really flat from the CPAP and their their eyes were swollen. And and I thought, OK, you know, that's something that's something um typical that you would say to a new mom, your baby's so cute. And and thinking back, I think I really appreciated that. Um, that was nice to hear. <laughs> and here we are holding them, talking about kangaroo care for the first time. Um, Penny got her CPAP off very quickly. Um, and I was very excited about that. And then the next day I came and it was back on. And again, that those emotions kind of going from a really high, you know, texting all of my family and saying, she's got her CPAP off and then coming in and seeing that she had it back on again. Again, I know now that was a very normal thing. She was still at this point, 10 weeks premature, maybe even 11. Um, so that was uh, some, a hurdle to get over, but our primary nurse uh, really helped us with that. So the next 58 days we spent at Mount Sinai, uh, we watched our babies grow and uh, we really learned a lot from our nurses at this time. That's Penny on the left. And it's funny because she looks exactly the same to me right now. And Brooke is on the right. And after our 58 days at Sinai, we spent seven days at Humber River Hospital, which was our community hospital. And we met some great nurses there and we were able to um, get more of a sense of, OK, you know, uh, a releasing of um, responsibility from the nurses to us. So this was when we really got to take them out whenever we wanted. They were big at this time, six pounds. So we were able to um, feel more mom and dad like, I would say. And then coming home, two little fighter hats there. I got those at Mount Sinai right outside the NICU doors and us at the preemie picnic, uh, which was a great way to sort of round out the whole NICU stay. And we were able to see actually one of our primary nurses at the picnic. That was great. Uh, it was nice to see her face again. And uh, next I will be talking a little bit about who those nurses are. So our primary nurses, so uh, we had two primary nurses at Mount Sinai, Elizabeth and Dawn. So Elizabeth um, became our primary nurse really quickly for Penny. Um, so within about two or three days of us entering the NICU, um, I really had a good feeling from her. Again, in my line of work, I, I work a lot uh, with other adults and I found like uh, that her and I worked well with each other you know she she could kind of sense when i needed some kind of privacy to be alone she could sense them you know when i was and i think rebecca mentioned this when i was wanting to do something but was afraid to do something or or you know i didn't want to overstep and she was really great at saying oh just stick your hand in there and and again making everything seem like it was going really great and and i do feel that we were lucky uh we didn't have any really big setbacks in the in the NICU um but elizabeth really made it seem like um everything is going great everything is exactly how you need it to be and yet you know when things did uh slide or you know when the 
monitors and everything was going off, she would she would really have a really down to earth um, feel about it. And I'm a very I'm someone who uses humor a lot myself, almost to mask uh, some emotions. And she was uh, great at sort of matching that with me. So so it was great to be with her. And Dawn was actually Brooke's nurse. Um, she started with us just after the new year. She was an amazing, amazing nurse. Like her attention to detail was uh, was amazing to watch. She really taught us a lot of the skills that we still currently use. Um, and I'll get to that on the next slide. Not only teaching us the basics of bathing, there's the two of them bathing there. Uh, my husband, Keith, is uh, feeding penny with the bottle there again we'd never done this before i'd never breastfed I, I didn't even know how to do it it was something i was going to research maybe later on in the pregnancy so i know elizabeth did a lot of work with me on uh breastfeeding and um nns and things like that and dawn really helped us with uh you know things like learning to swaddle and 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 learning to bathe and to not be um and to be confident about it and it's funny because I was doing a lactation consult with my newborn, Rachel, um, a few months ago. And I, I sat her up to burper and the lactation consultant said, do you have any kids that were in the NICU? And I said, actually, yes. And she goes, that's a NICU burp. And I, <laughs> and I said, well, of, of course it is because it works. Um, those nurses know exactly what to do to, to get it done and to get it done quickly. And, and we still use so many of the skills today. Um, when bathing our three and a half year olds, we actually still take a towel um, after we wash their hair, we dry their hair before they play in the bath for the next half hour. Because I remember um, Dawn saying that they lose the heat from their head. And I think we're past the point of needing to do that now, but we still do it. Uh, we have one of the best swaddles of, of any of other parents that we know, thanks to our NICU nurses. They really helped us, um, really helped us a lot with those basic skills um, that really help you get through it all. So here I just have a little slide of how it started. There we are, we just had our masks off, looking unrecognizable to anything that we would uh, see in the next year or even three years and how it's going now. So uh, there's Penny and Brooke, we graduated from the, the uh, NICU follow-up clinic just this past fall and there's holding their certificates there. Uh, they passed with flying colors and there's us on Mother's Day with the new edition uh, just the past weekend or two weekends ago when Mother's Day was. And your impact. So I was trying to think of something that I could say to explain to nurses how impactful uh, you really are. Um, so there's Penny and Brooke holding up their preemie outfits. And the way I find that you are most impactful in how your work will live on um, is we let our children know um, how helpful you were and how much um, you you have played a role in their lives. Uh, we have a little book and I think they're reading one of them there in that picture. We have a little book where we have sort of keepsakes of their NICU experience, you know, pictures of them with tubes to the point where when my newborn was born, they said, where's her tubes? Um, so the other thing that we do, as Fabiana mentioned, was um, I run a premium clothing bank for the, the Toronto Parents of Multiple Birth Association that I'm a part of. And it's called Tiny Treasures. And when when parents are sort of blindsided by a NICU stay or or even just by a small baby and, and they haven't had time or the resources to go and buy preemie clothes, we were some of those people, um, then I can actually uh, have a bank of clothing that I can go and drop off to them and then we kind of share it around the group. So that's been a really great experience and it's also helped me to connect with other uh, preemie parents and to help them out with, uh, with what they need and especially with those multiple parents because it's like everything is times two. So I just have a quote here that I found that I liked. It says, a truly amazing neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit nurse is hard to find and impossible to forget. Um, so a lot of people tell me in my line of work, you know, um, as a teacher or, or even more so as a special ed education teacher, you are, you know, leaving in uh, footprints on, on your students and you are really... Um, 
you know, they're going to remember you forever and you're, you're making such an impact, but it's hard to see that um, as a teacher, there's so many, uh, so many politics and, and things that happen behind the scenes. And I really recognize that, especially with the past two years with COVID, that nursing must be very, very similar in that way. There's so many other layers to the job that may keep you from recognizing how important you are and, and how important you are to others and their lives. Uh, so I did want to say this as sort of an ending quote that you you are impossible to forget. We we talk about you still to this day, our primary nurses, Elizabeth and Dawn, amongst others, and our kids know your names and um, you will definitely live on in the story of their lives and hopefully what they can uh, give their children as well. And, and they can let them know about their experience as well. And I hope one of them becomes a NICU nurse, that would be amazing. Um, but if not, that's okay too. So Fabiana, that's it for me. Thank you so much for listening. Wow, Laura, thank you so much. That was such a great story. And actually our next speaker is a NICU nurse who was a, who was a premature baby coming up next. But I just, I, honestly, I wanna thank you for sharing your story and experience with the nurses. We share the same NICU, uh, was there many years before you, but I also have that same feeling of gratitude to our primary nurses, Edna and uh, Karen. Karen's still there uh, many years. And I actually met Elizabeth at dawn and I absolutely love them because they're incredible nurses. So in the beginning of your presentation, you talk about communication, how they describe the baby to you, that the babies were big, even though they were two pounds and also how cute they were. And we also hear from parents all the time, like the words that the nurses say to us is stick with us. So how impactful were those words to you along your NICU stay? And how did that change your perception of your babies in the NICU? I think it did. I think I think um, their sort of words of encouragement about the babies was very helpful. Um, it not only made me feel like you know, being in the NICU, you're just, you're in another world. And, and no matter how many texts you send to your friends or pictures you send to your friends, or, you know, I, I'd put their little milestones up on Instagram and say, you know, we hit four pounds today. That is almost unbelievable to everyone else that, you know, it's, it's not something that I got a lot of feedback from. And I think that's because um, a lot of our friends and family didn't really know what to say. I think they didn't, realize um and and how could you um you know realizing the gravity of the situation is is almost impossible and actually i have a sister-in-law who uh, she's a twin herself and she had twins also at 20 actually she had the twins at 25 weeks so this was something i was a little bit familiar with um from her but everyone else they don't know what to say so so i find that the words that the nurses were telling me were so nice because no one else was really saying those things um you know no no one was saying oh you know your baby's so cute or um asking the questions really that you that you want them to ask as as a regular newborn you know are they doing this yet are they doing this yet well of course not they're still not supposed to be out yet um, but it, it's a different set of knowledge. And I think that, uh, yeah, it was very helpful. And I think it, it helped me um, for the future if I know people with, with children in the NICU. And I, I've, I've been close to one other person who has, and, and I just, I know what to say. And, and I'll say to them, oh, you know, they're so cute. Or they look so big. Because um, I know that that's what they want to hear. Absolutely. Uh, my next question to you is regarding uh, primary nurses. Uh, how... Did you, how was your experience with the primary nurse? Because a lot of families say, you know, there is this constant change of nurses and the nurse don't know my baby, but you had two primary nurses. How was that for your family? It was very important. I didn't know um, the idea about a primary nurse until it was actually Elizabeth who um, a few days in asked us, she said, you know, you can actually have a nurse with you all the time um who knows your baby when, whenever they're on the clock of course um and and we thought about it and we said and and at first i kind of thought um you know maybe it would be good to have different nurses like i i, I didn't know i i didn't know um 
the, the, the benefits of it at that point. But, you know, getting to know Elizabeth and Dawn, you know, we both, uh, me and my husband would both go home at night. We'd say, they're so great. You know, like, can, can they be the nurses with the, with the kids all the time? And they're so easy to talk to. And we were getting to know them at this point, um, like on a friend level as, as well. And, and when I wasn't able to be in the NICU, I would call in and I would ask for Elizabeth or Dawn and they would chat with me on the phone about the kids. So I think I think it's very, very important to have that connection. And I, I can't speak for people who are in the NICU for a much shorter amount of time. But since we were there for two months, I can't imagine not having someone that you know that well and not having someone that knows your babies that well. Um, so I think it's important that in that way. Absolutely. So, Laura, thank you so much for being here today, for sharing your story with us and your beautiful uh, family with us. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'm very excited to share and bring our last guest to this uh, special premium chats today. Uh, let me bring her to our stream, Chantel Maureen. Uh, she's going to share her journey as a new NATO nurse who was born preterm and also became the mother of three premature babies. Chantel will explore what led her to become an ICU nurse and share her story of not only being a nurse for preterm infants, but a survived preterm infant herself and a mom to three late preterm babies and how the role of the ICU has evolved. Chantelle Maurice is a clinical nurse educator for the Family Birding Center and ICU and pediatric departments at the Brand for Community Healthcare System. Previous to this role, she worked at the Queensway Carlton Hospital in Ottawa for 18 years in labor and delivery, postpartum and special care nursery and she also spent many years clinical teaching. Chantel, thank you so much for joining us here today. Oh, thank you for having me. And I will actually bring back to our streaming Rebecca Thomas, because we want this to be all about the nurses. And I feel that both of you share so much. There's so much in common between the two of you. So Rebecca is gonna join us to help us with your, uh, you know, your session, your questions. Uh, so thank you, Rebecca, for uh, coming back here today. And I will start by asking you, I already, we already spoiled the, the, the theme of the session. How, what led you to become a nurse? Um, exactly what you said. Um, if you asked me when I was five years old what I was going to do, I was going to be a NICU nurse. And I knew exactly what that meant because I was born at 27 weeks. That was 41 years ago. There was very little chance of survival or survival without long-term deficits. Um, you can see there, I have a photo at two days and there that's the next four and a half week one is the next photo of me. There was no more photos um, just because things were touch and go and nobody really knew what to expect. Um, but I proved feisty from day one. Um, my mom kept a journal when she, I was actually born at McMaster as well. So very, very fortunate to be in such an amazing, amazing place. Um, and she kept a journal and there was notes, I guess at the time we, they used like a warmer type bed and they used to put cellophane over top to keep the heat in. And I was always getting tangled up in it. So they had to take it off. <laughs> um, and then in nine days I was breathing on my own, like from a ventilator to breathing on my own. There was no CPAP then there really wasn't nothing else. So I think I proved pretty early on that, you know, look out world, I'm here and I'm going to stay my, yeah. And my NICU journey was four and a half months in total. Um, no, three and a half months. Okay. I was born December 23rd and I went home April 1st. So oh, you guys do the, I did get back up. My hometown is Guelph. So I did get back up to Guelph from McMaster in February. Um, and my family just always said like, you are here today because of the nurses that cared for you. You've done so well in your life because of the nurses that cared for you. So I just grew up knowing that these amazing NICU nurses saved my life and made it so that I, I'm okay. Like, you know, and I was very fortunate to be part of Dr. Sagel's long-term study at McMaster and her book, Preemie Voices, if anyone's familiar with that. And it wasn't until 2014 when Dr. Sagel invited myself and the other Preemie Voice authors to come to the book launch at McMaster. And my third son at that point was only six months old. So I came down and to sit in this room of fellow preemies that I'd never seen. Like I go to McMaster and I go to the, do the study for the day. And at the end of the day, they're like, oh, come into the NICU. And they gown me up and they say, now this baby was as big as you were when you were born. And at five years old and eight years old and 13, I'm like, oh, okay, that's, that's really tiny. That's cool. But I didn't have that same concept of what it meant. And then when I sat in this room of my fellow preemies 
And I saw those that were not so fortunate that were blind, that were deaf, that were had CP. And I was just so humbled. I was just like, oh, oh my God. Like, and there's some days, you know, my other passion in the DQ was trauma informed care. And I remember saying to the author of that program, like, according to everything, I shouldn't be okay. How am I okay? Like, I had extreme, my mother, my background, my mom had spinal cancer and that's why I was born early because there was surgery involved and we were separated a lot because of her treatments at St. Mike's in Toronto. And she's just like, you know, you must've had a lot of love around you. So I just have to think, you know, if my family couldn't be there, each and every nurse that took that time to give me my extra love because our my, my mom couldn't be there with me. Right. So that's, yeah, I just, I always knew this is what I was going to do and no one was going to stop me from doing it. <laughs> um, and when I went to nursing school, I knew that's what I wanted to do. Like, I'm like, oh, I don't want to do all this adult stuff. <laughs> like, I get through my rotations just because I had to. And I'm like, but then I did fall in love with labor and delivery a little bit too. So I've worked all scopes of perinatal care. But Nick, you found my heart. And that's where Amazing. I Amazing. We are so fortunate then to have you as a NICU nurse in Canada. So Chantel, how were you in touch with the nurses throughout your uh, childhood? Your parents kept in, you connected with them, uh, and how were you treated differently from other siblings and other family members because your opinion you had that get go when you were younger? So no, there is no further connection with anyone that took care of me. Only going back to McMaster once in a while. Um, you know, through the study, there would sometimes be a nurse that's like, I think I remember you. Um, I can't remember what year it was. I want to say 2013 or 14, the McMaster Neonatal Association put on an amazing conference in Niagara Falls, um, whatever year that was. And myself and some coworkers came down from Ottawa. And there was a nurse there that day that remembered my story and said, I'm pretty sure I took care of you. And I was just, wow. Like, you know, at that point, it had been 30 plus years. When we went to Preemie Voices book launch, there was a physician that came up to my father afterwards and said, I don't totally remember your name, but I 100% worked in the unit when you were there and I took care of you. And my dad, it was more my dad. He just completely choked up and just shook his hand and said, thank you. Like, mm -hmm. you know, what, what could he say? Like, that's all there really was to say is thank you. Right. So, um, was I treated, I'm an only child, so <laughs> I can't say how things were different just because I was a preemie, right? Because it, it is just me. So, yeah. Wow. What a, what a journey. Um, Rebecca, do you have any question for Chantel? We can go ahead. Sure. I, I, I had forgotten that you were also a labor and delivery nurse as well. You have quite literally touched every stage in the process for our families yes. that there could be antepartum, postpartum, labor and delivery, <laughs> NICU, the, the experience of being a preemie, of, of, of growing and in, in, in using the neonatal follow-up clinic as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's very cool. Uh, looking back at the trail of breadcrumbs that led you right here yeah. must just be kind of a tremendous experience to see what led you to this point in your life. Yeah, some, some days it's it's very surreal. Um, and then, yeah, and it was just, you know, I know sometimes in nursing they say, you know, stay professional, don't bring your personal life in. But there are some days when I would have those parents that, you know, I, I worked in a, a community hospital, not a level three, but those parents are still just as scared as any other preemie parent, right? They, they don't know. And some days I would look at them and either tell the story of one of my own kids or myself, and it, you could just see it would calm them down. Like... Or when I'd have that person in labor and they're terrified or I'm going on an ambulance run because they're 29 weeks and their water broke and I'm riding with them and I'd be like, it's okay. Like, it's going to be okay. And I'll, I can backtrack a bit. My second son was almost born at 30 weeks. We held on for four more weeks. And my husband always said to me, he looked at me and if I didn't panic, he didn't panic. And in the back of my head, I'm like, 30 weeks, this sucks, but they'll be okay because I was okay. Like that was just always like, I was okay. They'll be okay. Like, this is okay. My biggest thing was the hospital was closed that day and the NICU was so full and I was more panicked. But where are you going to put my baby? <laughs> the nurse and me couldn't turn off. I'm like, but you don't have any beds. Where are you supposed to put them? Like, they're like, it's okay. We'll find space. I'm like, but you have no beds. <laughs> that was like the bigger panic. So um, I think 
moving along the journey. I'm glad I did it the way I did. I'm glad I, you know, didn't jump right as that young 22 year old nurse into a NICU environment that I built up some really solid skills in postpartum and labor and delivery and understood that basis before moving into the NICU. Um, and then it really helped when I had my three late preterm babies as well. So Jacob was born at 36 weeks and one day, and he spent eight days in the NICU. So definitely not as journey as most, but still it's your first baby. And there he is now. Yeah. Now I didn't send a after picture, but Jacob turned 16 last week. <laughs> um, and he's done amazing. And he's, yeah, he was just a lazy little fart that didn't want to eat. <laughs> at 36 weeks and he's still that very laid back personality like anything goes eh, whatever mom I'll write my license when I'm ready like I'm like okay don't you want to go drive well yeah but I'm not ready I'm like okay so that's Jacob and then we had Eric and I was labor delivery nurse at the time and then we had Eric Eric was 34 weeks and five days um a little rougher road just to start initially needed respiratory help that Jacob didn't need um it was a little more challenging. I was not a NICU nurse then yet, but given my background and my keen interest, if I wasn't busy in labor and delivery, I was in the NICU. Like I was always, what can I do? What, where can I help? So I was already kind of building up my foundation for him. Um, as in, I had a hard time turning off my nurse brain with Eric a lot. I was like, he got off CPAP. I wanted to hold him. I was being denied kangaroo care. It was really frustrating, like as a mom, but as a nurse too, knowing the benefits of, Eric. Um, but Eric, you know, similar to Laura's story, I was in the hospital for four weeks threatening to deliver him. So away from my two-year-old, away from my family. And I was very fortunate the hospital I was admitted in, I had worked at as well. So I knew a lot of the staff. And I can't imagine if had I not had those relationships with the staff, how much more lonely it would have felt, right? And then that's Luke. Luke was born at 36 weeks as well. Um, and as our only baby that didn't go to the NICU, he did beautiful. Uh, he was born with, you can see in the picture, he was born with a cleft lip and a gum um, and came home in two days. Like <laughs> he just, and he breastfed for three years and had his lip repair and did beautifully. Um, so I really, as a nurse, I, sh I, I don't mind sharing my stories with anybody, with a, a parent, like even to this day, staff now, like especially with the, our cleft babies, they're like, oh, we have someone you talk to. And I go in that room and I take my nurse's hat off and I'm like, I'm going to talk to you as a mom today. And they're so grateful because when we were expecting Luke to be born, we had nobody to talk to. I still remember after we got Luke's diagnosis, the first time I walked, I was a NICU nurse at the time. And the first time I walked back into the NICU, I just bawled my eyes out looking down at a baby's normal face. I, cause I knew my son was not going to look like that. And I didn't know what he was going to look like, but it took me a couple shifts to get through not crying, going to work and seeing these babies. Right. So, yeah. Wow, what a journey. So, Chantel, and I ask the same question, Rebecca. How having three babies born preterm changed your practice? You came now from another perspective, right? You were adult, adult preemie, you were a nurse, but now you had three babies, two in the ICU. Yeah. How was that experience for you? I think it changed my practice in that... I realized how much, how important it is to really truly involve the families um, and empower them that these are their babies and they really do know them best and trust that, that these are the ones at the bedside and support them that, you know, don't, it's okay to touch them. It's okay to hold them. Um, not just, I think I was able to step back a little bit more and empower them. Hey, why don't you do the temperature today? Right. Or you open the doors, you take them out, or here's how to turn the monitor off when you get here and hold them. So it was it was easier to step back as a nurse and like let that nursing control that everybody wants go a little bit and really empower the parents to do it. Oh, incredible. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to go back one question uh, when you actually decide to become an EQ nurse and it was your first day in the NICU. How was that experience for you? Oh my God, it was so exciting. <laughs> I had waited so long to do it. I had actually gone back to, I'd taken some extra classes. I had gone back to school and I was given a clinical placement um, at a tertiary center. So those were like my first student days. And it took, it took everyone a little while to warm up to me. Everyone, it took till they realized this isn't just a nursing student. This is someone that has 10 years experience already and is coming into this. But, you know, that moment that you finally, you get in there and you realize like, this is, this is what, this is what it's about. This is what I meant to do. Like, 
it just it reaffirms everything. And even I never hesitate in my current role to go into the NICU and it's like, who needs help? Who needs to be fed? Like, oh, can I put that IV in today? <laughs> like, you know, I, I and um, ironically today as end of nurse this week, I am actually working frontline again in their pediatric department because they needed help. So, and I've got two little babies to take care of. So I'll take the babies any day. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is great. Rebecca, any question for for Chantel? I was just thinking how cool it was that your happy place is the same as my happy place. And when the day is starting to turn upside down and things feel like you just can't get a handle on them, walking into the unit and seeing the care and seeing the families and seeing the babies is a reset. Mm -hmm. And it's it's exactly where I go. So I, I really like that comment that you just made. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, it's just like, wonderful. this is why we're here, right? Like, like step away from all the craziness or, you know, this, this role that I'm in now is it's a different overwhelming. It's a different stress, but at the end of the day, sometimes it's like, let's just walk away and go remember why you're doing what you're doing now to now it's more, not as much about empowering parent, parents. It's about empowering staff to truly give these little ones the care that they deserve to have the best outcomes they possibly can. Absolutely. So you are both members of the Canadian Association of Neonatal Nurses. Let's talk a little bit about CAN because it's such a great organization. We do a lot of collaborations with CAN uh, and it is National Nursing Week. I, well, how better way to wrap this up? Talk about such a great organization supporting the nurses in Canada. So Chantel, maybe you'll talk a little bit what CAN really is and what, what is the role of CAN in Canada. And Rebecca, I know you're on the board, so you also just step in and let's talk about Ken a little bit. I am going to totally high five and take team Rebecca on this because she's the, she's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start, but she's going to follow her in a little bit. I, I'm newer to Ken. Um, you know, I have attended conferences and such, which is great pre-COVID obviously, um, which is great for networking and finding that group of like-minded people and finding like the again, that community, like, this is where I belong. This is where I fit in. It really hasn't been until I stepped into this role nine months ago that I've gotten more involved with CAN. Um, and I, and then Becky there with her awesome, what do we call it? It's our professional development group. Yeah, okay. Um, being part of this team has really allowed us to come together from all across Canada to realize we're all facing the same challenges and what can we do to truly support each other in our roles and help to standardize things as well because we're all trying to do our own thing but why not just work together when you know why do you have to write the policy and i have to write the policy when we could just share the policy or something like that right so um i think it's just a really great collaborative team that's looking to help standardize our care and bring us all together that is great yeah, right. and i would Okay, sorry. I was going to resonate. Uh, I was going to repeat what uh, Chantel had just said, which is just it's a great opportunity. You've said it before. It's a small world being in the NICU. People outside don't really get it because they haven't lived it. And we're living it from all of our different perspectives. And uh, to Chantel's point, why do things separately when we have the opportunity to connect, collaborate and drive care forward faster together? Absolutely. So that's what we're up to. Mm -hmm. That is wonderful. So I want to thank both of you for uh, joining our live session today, for sharing your personal stories. I am super grateful, um, you know, to just acknowledge all the nurses today of this, uh, this Nursing Week in Canada. So thank you so much for being here today, for sharing your journeys, uh, and we are sure continue to collaborate with Ken. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fabiana. Thank you, Chantal. Thank you, Rebecca. And for all of you watching us live today on our YouTube channel, Facebook or Twitter, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, the video of today's session and all the videos from our live series are available on the CPBF website, which is the CanadianPremies.org. And I want to thank our sponsors, Medela Canada and AstraZeneca, for their ongoing support to our education sessions. And we are a charitable organization, and we believe that through support and education, we can empower families, ensuring they're ready to care for their babies. Please visit our website, consider making a donation. Together, we can create a brighter future for all our families. 
And I see you again next Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Stay well.